Let's start with questions. Does anybody have a question? Is it okay? Um, so I put a new version of QED.pdf on the, the uh, notes on perturbation. Here's the new version on the web. Um, and uh, the main changes in it are that I've um, added the derivation of the free Hamiltonian. Um, the, that is to say, the Fourier expansion of the free Hamiltonian. Um, that turns out to be a little more complicated than I thought. And uh, so I think I'll, I'll go through that today because I haven't yet done that this far in class as far as I recall. Um, another thing that I added was um, just a, a somewhat better way of doing uh, doing the the um, producing the formula for scattering this for scattering amplitudes without going through the whole rigmarole of the interaction picture. This is um, Weinberg's uh, cute way of doing it. And um, the main thing I added was uh, the amplitude for electron-positron scattering, which I hope to start and maybe finish today. My understanding is that we finished electron-electron scattering, right? Is that right? I Okay, good. Somebody has looked at the notes. All right. Um, okay, so let me, um, let me, I also updated on November 28th the notes on Dirac spinners. Those, those were, I think, minor updates. So let us um, start with this H0. It's, um, so the starting point which itself is a little bit mysterious, is that the, um, Hamiltonian for non-interacting direct particles or spin one half particles, and this would be true for Majorana as well as Dirac, because after all, Dirac just means you have two Majorana fields of equal mass and you put them together. Notice that these are just space derivatives, no time derivatives. And of course, as always, psi bar is I psi dagger gamma zero. All right, so as usual, we have to remember what these fields are. Well, psi L, L goes from one to four, of x is a sum s equals minus or plus for the two, uh, well, say spin up, spin down, ul of p and s, b of p and s, e to the i p x plus bl of p and s. You've seen this many times, but it's And let me just write psi dag in a slightly abbreviated form. It's obviously going to be this sum, um, this integral. And now it would be UL star of P and S. Or if we think of it as a vector, then U dagger. B dagger of P and S, e to the minus I PX plus VL dagger PS, C of P and S. E to the I PX. And again, DQC over 2 pi to the 3 halves. These Fourier expansions, of course, clarify things, but they really wear out one's shoulder if you're teaching on a chalkboard. Um, now, as we saw in the, the, these fields have the free field time dependence which is what's expressed here, Px, of course, is P dot x minus P0, x0, and of course, P0, square root of P vector squared plus m squared. So the result is that these spinners, P0 
these fields satisfy the free Dirac equation, and so the spinners have to satisfy the Dirac equation of momentum space, which is I. You can write it this way, I gamma dot P plus M on U of P and S is equal to I gamma zero P zero U of P and S. <coughs> And minus i gamma dot p, so these are three vectors, plus m, v of p and s is minus i gamma zero p zero v of p and s. So this is stuff, all of this is from the, that is to say, this line, this line, this line, and this line are from the um, notes on Dirac spinners. And I'll maybe add at this point, I'll skip ahead and add something else about Dirac spinners right now. Namely, that U dagger of P and S, U of P and S prime is delta S, S prime. So these spinners are, are the U spinners are orthonormal in a two-dimensional space for the same P. It's also true that V dagger of P and S, V of P and S prime is delta S, S prime. On the other hand, the cross matrix elements, and now let me put in these, I've been a bit sloppy in these notes as to whether P is a three vector or a four vector. The reason is to express it as a three vector, I have to write backslash VEC in front of it, which is, a lot of extra trouble, and um, it's occasionally though useful. And here we want to say v of minus three p vector s prime is zero, and or, and the adjoint equation of course is v of p vector s u of minus p vector s prime is also zero. So there are these four relations. These relations I haven't, I did not derive in class, I don't think. I put the derivation in the Dirac spinner notes. Um, uh, I have a question. The, the I gamma dot P plus M U of P and S I thought earlier you said that that was zero. Am I? Ah, what you're thinking of is you move the i gamma zero p zero to the other side. Oh, okay. You then have a four vector expression, okay. so those are three vectors. and then you get zero. And what that looks like is simply this: i d slash p. No, i p slash. It's I P slash plus M U equals zero. Um, these particular relations, um, I, I can just say you, how they follow the, remember that the spinners at momentum zero are eigenvectors of gamma zero with certain eigenvalues. We then make the natural choices and those choices tell you that at momentum zero, these relations are satisfied. You then boost, and it turns out the, um, those uh, relations are preserved at finite momenta, so um, non-zero momenta. So I think I'll, I'll just leave that as it is and um, take these for granted maybe assign them as a homework problem. All right. So let's now substitute these expressions for the fields in here and see what we get for H0. And it turns out then that it is I out in front, an integral, a sum on S, an integral, and Apparently, I wrote this as 
dq p prime over 2 prime to the 3 halves. And then what we have is this structure here. And so I wrote this as u dagger of p prime s prime d dagger p prime s prime e to the minus i p prime x plus v dagger c well v dagger of p prime s prime c of p prime s prime um, e to the i p prime x and then there's a gamma zero the i is this i and now that multiplies a sum, so this is a sum on s prime. Now we have a sum on s an integral dqp over 2 pi 3 halves. And now what we have is, let's see, did I skip something? Yes, well, good thing I checked this out before writing the whole line. What we have is, this uh, gamma dot grad plus m is hitting this field, and that's what we're going to stick down here. And when this thing hits the exponential, it gives us i gamma um, dot p plus m, u of p and s, b of p and s, e to the i p x, plus minus i gamma dot p plus m v of p and s c dagger of p and s e to the minus i p x. Okay, now I've been writing small. Can you guys see it? And can the camera capture that? Uh, I think so. I mean, I'll zoom in a little bit and get a... I, maybe I should try to write bigger. Anyway, this, how did this get to be I gamma dot P? Well, when gamma dot grad hits E to the I P X, it pulls down, a grad turns into an I P. So it's I gamma dot P vector. But over here, when the gamma dot grad hits this part, it hits a minus i px, so this brings down a minus i gamma dot p plus m. And the two pi's in these direct things are two pi to the minus three halves. Okay, so now we invoke these, the, the, the spinner satisfied the Dirac equation, and it's on the on the U spinners, the particle spinners, it's I gamma dot P plus M gives I gamma zero P zero. But on the antiparticle spinners, it's minus I gamma dot P plus M gives minus I P zero gamma zero. And so, what I could maybe do to save time is to say that this thing turns into simply I gamma zero P zero, and this turns into minus i gamma zero p zero. So that's the next step. You just replace this parenthesis by i gamma zero p zero, and this parenthesis by minus i gamma zero p zero. Okay, now we've got a lot of gamma zeros. We've got one here, which came from the bar, and we've got one here and one there. Gamma zero squared is minus one. And moreover, we have an i here and an i there. i squared is minus one. And so we get a, just a plus sign here and we get a minus sign there. And the result is the result is that this I really want to use my eraser and not... What do you think? You, you guys tell me. Should I rewrite the equation? Use the eraser. Use the eraser? I want to. 
All right. Using magic of an eraser, I get rid of the gamma zero. I get rid of this gamma. I get rid of this i. Get rid of this gamma zero and this i. All of this is gone. And we just have a nice p zero here. Over here, it's the same business, but it's minus p zero. Okay, so that's a much simpler uh, expression. And now, um, we see that I made a mistake. Nobody called me on this. There's a p cubed x here. Which was this, because the Hamiltonian is always an integral over space of the fields at a fixed time, let us say time is zero. So, so now we have the space integral, the space integral, and this just gives us Dirac delta functions. In fact, we have a two pi to the minus three halves, and so we're just going to get exactly delta functions. But we also have the time components floating around. So initially, it's somewhat, it's something that when you do this the first time yourself, you would find this a little bit worrying. So the two pi's are gone. But now what we have. Where'd they go? Uh, 2 pi to the minus 3. 1 over 2 pi to the d cubed x times a phase factor is a delta function. Whoops. Oh, and I have to pay the... Thank you. Well, what's the going rate? Is it 2 for the person with the camera? Not for him. Huh? Not for him. <laughs> yeah, I'd say, I'd say one's good for me. Uh, has anyone else asked a question and I forgot to... Oh, I'm sorry. I don't quite understand what you mean. Is that a function that you can't? No, 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 no. I can't catch the thing. All right, well, whoever wants to take um, it. Anyway, I just don't quite understand what you mean there. Why would a delta function All right, all right. Great question. When I was a graduate student faced with these things, my favorite thing was Dirac's delta function because it cleared the page of so much, so many symbols. Integral d cubed x over 2 pi cubed. And let's take a representative example. The two u's. We have e to the minus i p prime minus p x, combining these two. Okay. And what this gives us is then delta Q of, let us say, P minus P prime. The thing is even and looks so much nicer this way. But then it's E to the I, P prime 0 minus P 0 T. Because these are four vectors, and that's left over. So this is, so in, in, if it's a d cubed x integration, you need three two pi's. d fourth x, you need four of them. I see, so this is the definition here. Yeah. Well, it's our standard, our standard formula for the direct delta function. Oh, right, I think I remember. Yeah, this, the, this, there are only two things we remember in physics. What's a delta function and what the Pauli matrices are. Everything else you forget. Why can you combine the two terms and the one of them is a U and one of them is a gamma? I don't understand the question. Are you talking about these relations? So here, those two terms you combine to make that delta function. Well, well, it's because you've got this sum of two terms multiplying yeah. this sum of two terms. So one, so you get four terms. One of them is this. Pretty multiplied by all the other stuff. Yeah, so you've got to have you've got to have this one times this, this one times that, plus this one times this, plus that one times that, and these things. Uh, 
come up over here, and so here's what we have left. We have u dagger, and let me do, let me just say prime u b dagger prime b p zero, and then e to the minus i p prime zero minus p zero t delta of p minus p prime vector. So that's the first term. The next term, and when I'm doing prime, I mean p prime s prime, no prime p s. Okay, just to, just so we don't have to have, use so much chalk. Then it's b dagger, b prime dagger, v, C prime, C dagger, P zero, E to the minus I, P prime zero minus P zero T. T is the same thing as X zero. But now it's delta of P minus P prime. Well, that's what it was before. And then we have minus u prime dagger v b prime dagger c dagger p zero and now e to the i p prime zero plus p zero and if you want we can write this as x zero x zero and t are the same. And this is delta of p plus p prime. And then plus v prime dagger u c prime b p zero e mistake here, I think. All right, so let's look at this one carefully and get it straight. This is B dagger U, and you see this will have a minus, this will be E to the minus I P prime zero plus P zero x zero. The other two e's. So there's a typo here. Typo on the board too. Huh? Or two e's. I wrote it wrong on the board. Just, two just, e's. just wrote an extra e. Huh? You just kind of rewrote the e after. Oh. All right. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Well, these delta functions do the following, what we're left with is some on, oh, hey, this is a good piece of chalk for a change. This says that P prime is P, but in this, and this, in this term, P prime is P, but in this term, P prime is minus P. Oh, and I forgot, this is delta of P plus P prime, so this also sets P prime equal to minus P. And so what we get now is u dagger, and maybe I'll write this out completely, u dagger ps, u of ps prime, p0, and I'll just write it as b dagger b. Well, maybe I'll write it in detail, especially since I have a nice piece of chalk. And then we have minus v dagger of p <coughs> s prime v of um, p s 
Okay, so th this is what's written in the notes. It's just, okay, then C of P S prime, C dagger of P S and uh, a P zero here that I somehow left out. Now these are the two good terms. And here are the two crazy terms. Minus U dagger of minus P S prime V of P and S P dagger of minus P and S prime P of P and S and the P zero that I forgot and E to the two I P zero X zero and then V Sorry, this particular term, isn't that a B dagger C dagger? And then B dagger B? Which term? This one? Right. I think you're right. I think you're right. This one, okay, it's the third term. Yeah, that's a C dagger. Okay, I've got this all screwed. B dagger is right, and this is a C dagger. All right. You're entitled to two. You want them for tomorrow or something? Okay, and the next term is V dagger of minus P S prime U of P and S. C of minus P S prime B of P and S um, a P zero that I'm going to just sort of stick in there and then let me just carrot this in E to the minus 2i P zero X zero and there's the final right bracket. Okay. What's happened to your P prime zeros? P prime zeros. P prime zero. Oh, P prime, good, great question. P prime vector is in the bottom ones is minus P. Yeah. And so the P, P zero prime is the same thing as P zero. Even though the delta function doesn't act over the fourth component. Right, because you see P P zero prime is P prime vector plus M squared. But if P prime is minus P, then it's also P squared plus M squared, and then that's P zero. So in the third term. This one. Yeah, so where P oh okay, so you're saying even though P prime is equal to minus P, then P prime zero is equal to just straight P. Zero. Right. In fact, I would say it's not even though, I would say because. Because, yeah. Great question. Here, you'll be entitled. Goodness sakes, to All right, any, any questions? Is there anybody hungry in the back with some idle question? By the way, in Shanghai, there was somebody to wash the boards um, before each lecture, so the boards were always clean. That's also true in Harvard. Um, fortunately, we we have a football team. Sorry, it's Harvard. Yeah, but they, Harvard doesn't spend any money on the football. Harvard also has a thirty billion dollar endowment. Yes. Chinese government has two trillion in treasury bonds. Um, right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, the fact is, though, American universities lose twelve billion a year on intercollegiate athletics. Okay, so now we have these crazy terms. 
But what comes to our rescue is these relations. The crazy terms are zero because u dagger of p and s, v of minus p and s prime is zero. And v dagger of p and s, u dot into u of minus p and s prime is zero. So these crazy terms are zero. I used up my good chalk. So all we have left are the nice terms, the terms that are time independent. And if there's anything you want of a Hamiltonian, it's that it should be time independent. All right, so what, we're, what we have left then, let me use the magic of an eraser again. So the sum over s prime is gone. The crazy terms are gone. We put in a right bracket. This thing is 0 unless s prime is s, in which case it's 1. So I just make this s prime an s, and I get rid of the v's. This is 0 unless s prime is s, in which case it's 1. So I get rid of the prime, and I just have that. So now this is a very nice expression. In fact, if we put the p0 here, you can have a nice big bracket. And that's our expression. OK, so when people first saw this, um, they must have been slightly puzzled, but only for a second, because we know what the commutation relations are. Let me use this part of the blackboard to just remind you that B of P and S, B dagger of P prime, S prime, plus B of P and S, B dagger of P prime, S prime, is delta S, S prime, delta Q of P minus P prime vectors. And the same thing for C. And because we have that relation with C, we have C, C dagger plus C dagger C equals delta. What we have over there is minus C, C dagger. So moving that to the other side, we get C dagger C minus delta equals minus C, C dagger. And so this Hamiltonian is actually a sum on S integral dQ P, P0. And now it's B dagger of P and S, B of P and S, plus C dagger of P and S, C of P and S. And now minus delta. Oh, what's the delta? It's delta of 0. So this is a very divergent term. And in fact, um, delta of 0 is really sort of puzzling. But if we rewrite, if we rewrite this term, in other words, what we have is integral d cubed x over 2 pi e to the i x dot say q is delta of q vector. Okay? So that means that delta of 0 vector is integral d cubed x over 2 pi q. Or it's the volume of the universe over 2 pi q. So another way of writing this is volume of the universe over 2 pi q.
So that's um, one of the uh, interesting things about fermions, namely that they they're just always so different from bosons. Bosons contribute positive zero point energy. These are called zero point energy. Positive zero point energies. The fermions contribute negative zero point energies. Um, notice this is an energy density because the total energy H0 is the volume of space times something or other. And so the energy, so to speak, the dark energy due to the fermions is, I'll write it as E sub D, it's minus sum on S, well that's a factor of 2. So it's 2 over 2 pi Q, uh, volume of the universe, integral dq p p0. Well, this thing is quartically divergent. And um, so that means you have a huge negative energy density. Um, on the other hand, all the Bose fields contribute positive energy densities. And um, so the puzzle is how do these things all add up to a positive energy density of, I think it's milli-electron volts to the fourth power. And um, nobody seems to know. That's the dark energy puzzle. Um, but of course, dark energy could be something totally different from this. It could be that the zero point, it could be that when we wrote this Hamiltonian, we were just taking the classical form, we should have tossed out these crazy terms and should have written the annihilation creation operators this way from the get-go. Um, the problem with, with, with that is that this normal ordering depends upon the mass of the fermions. If you change the mass, then um, the changing of the normal order and kicks out another infinite factor. It's not quartically divergent, but it might be quadratically divergent. All right. Anyway, this is um, a mystery and nobody really knows what, what to say about it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to normal, normally order this Hamiltonian, in which case you represent that by colons and we just it's kind of normal ordering is theoretical valium. So you you take the value, you, you normally order and you feel better. Okay, so that's H0. There's also a part for the uh, electromagnetic field, and let me just add that in. It's um, plus length of P, uh, A dagger of P and S, A of P and S. So this counts the number of photons of momentum P and helicity S, and the energy of each one is, is that. So I've normally ordered the Hamilton. So this is the free Hamiltonian. Uh, Can you just explain again where that came from? What? The bit. Um, just like that. This one? Yeah. Well, uh, the, the short answer is just common sense. I mean, the, you, if, you, if you're in the Coulomb game, there's the, um, the real live photons that we see, that we use to see. These have energy equal to their momentum because they're massless and we just count them up. That's the short answer. The long answer is you start with a formula like this of involving the electromagnetic field and it would be basically uh, something like a half e squared plus b squared integrated d cubed x. So this is what you'd get if you use a different... Yeah, okay. if you, yeah, if you use a half e squared plus b squared integral d cubed x 
that energy density would give you this eventually. There's also the other term, which is the Coulomb term, which is an instantaneous integral over charge distributions with the 1 over r. In other words, integral of rho of r, rho of r prime over r minus r prime integrated dq dot dq dot prime divided by, if I remember, 8 pi. That thing uh, in, as we saw when we were doing path integrals, that thing can get gets reabsorbed. In other words, what we're let, let me write down what the electromagnetic field is because we're we're about to because it's just not H zero anymore. No, this is still H zero. There we go. Okay, so the electromagnetic field that's left in the Coulomb gauge is a three vector, and it's a sum. I might as well do use the S notation, or I use lambda in the notes. Um, epsilon of k and s, this is a three vector, a of k and s, or since I used p over here, I'll use p here. Now the phase factor is dqp over 2 pi to the 3 halves, but there's also a square root of 2 k0 or 2 omega k, or 2 length of k vectors. quadratic pattern group we could do them. Same thing in operator field theory. If the Hamiltonian or Lagrangian is quadratic in the fields, we're okay. E squared plus B squared, quadratic. And that gives us our Hamiltonian, which just counts the number of electrons, the number of positrons, the number of photons, adds up all their energies, and that's the non-interacting energy. And that's what H0 is. They don't have interacting. They don't interact with each other. No. They exist with some energy. Right. But, of course, there is an interaction, and that's what, um, what we're going to use now to calculate. I mean, I assume we finished the electron-electron scattering, right? Yeah. I think so. Huh? I think so. Right. And you said yes, right? We, finished, we did that in class. Electron-electron. Both of them. We added them together. Yeah, I remember. All right. So now we have the normally ordered interaction, and this is simply I E integral psi bar of x, A slash of x, psi of x, D cubed x, or written more explicitly, I E integral psi dagger of x, gamma zero, gamma A, A sub A of x, Side of x. Shouldn't it just be negative? 
since the um, gamma bars the two i gamma dagger. Yes. As there, so just in the Brilliant. You're entitled to two. You want them? Sure. So, let's get on now to electron-positron scattering. So, let's first of all say what our U is. U is going to be a time-ordered exponential, and let me get this right, it's minus i, integral v of t dt and so that is time ordered exponential and now we have minus i times this v and this gives us i e integral psi dagger gamma zero gamma a a a psi d fourth x. So that's what we're going to call u. This is the u of infinity negative infinity negative 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm going to change my notation because the latex infinities take up so much horizontal space that it makes it hard to to latex the equation. So I'm, and it's always so I'm just going to use u for u infinity. So this is okay. So now. Let's see, maybe it's story time. What do you think? Yeah, yeah. I have like a... So you have a question? It's not really a real question. It's kind of... Why don't you turn the camera, so... Um, so, so, do there exist dualities between free what? theories and interacting theories? This is a... We're doing quantum electrodynamics. Right, and you... I don't know. It's just... I was just curious. About? About... Do, 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 like, so... Do there exist dualities between free theories and interacting theories? I didn't understand what. So, is there a interacting theory? Do there exist interacting theories that are dual to free field theories? Well, the interacting theory is typically the free theory plus an interaction. Right. So the total Hamiltonian is H0 plus V. Yeah, so I'm asking, is there a way you can write down a free field theory in some different fields that is the same as the interacting theory? That would be lovely. Um, <coughs> That's, that's something that's worth, you know, dreaming about. Um, and, you know, if you can, if you can get it to work, um, you know, it's, it's... Can you explain the question? I mean, uh, yeah, let, 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 let me just give you an example. Um, that, that, sort of suggests that you might be on the right track, but I don't know where the track leads. Let's think about general relativity. Okay. So what is the motion of a free particle in a gravitational field? Well, it's, it basically is, it follows a geodesic. Okay. So it's in a sense, it's the free, it's the, it's the free behavior, hmm. so to speak. Um, in other words, in four-dimensional space-time, the trajectory is just the shortest way to get from A to B, but 
this, the four dimensional space between A and B is curved. And um, so you can think of our four dimensional space time as something that's in a much bigger space time. It's partly bigger because of gravity, but you can also think of it as bigger because, um, say, the RGB are three different colors, but you can also think of them as um, so the right way to represent this quark field is the quark field RG times a vector E. Psi R E R, vector E R, plus Psi G, a vector E G, plus Psi B, a vector E B. These vectors then are in a big dimensional space. So it's natural to have, to consider huge dimensional spaces, and it's very possible that one could somehow formulate everything as a free theory in this curved space time. All right, so there was another question. Did, did you have any, your words, uh, you, whoa, oh, you got it, good, all right. Did you ask your question? I just wanted him, you to explain what he was asking well, so that I could kind of understand what you were trying to talk about. So the reason I ask is because, so in classical mechanics, you can write like a system of interacting masses on springs or something like that as a free theory of phonons. So I was wondering if there's something analogous you can right, do. Right, right, right. But notice the way you can do that. I mean, that's good. But the, notice that the way you were able to do that is it was a quadratic theory. Mm -hmm. All right, see. But again, don't give up. It's, it's something worth thinking about. But don't, you know, don't do it full time. Yeah. That makes it sense. All right, so let's see. The story time then. Let me try to make this somewhat brief. Um, There was an interesting discussion on C-SPAN over the weekend. Um, a professor, I think, of political science, I think he was from Harvard, but I'm really, I really don't remember where it was from, and I certainly don't remember his name or the book he wrote. But he was analyzing the question whether the flow of history is mainly economic and social forces or personalities, Napoleon, and so forth. Now, and um, so his tentative answer was that it was both, that in some cases it, the organization was so shaped by the bureauc by its internal bureaucracy and by competition from other organizations and by its system of advancement uh, that he gave the example of General Electric. He said they basically promote, they're, they're constantly rating their employees and when they need to pick a new head, they have typically five candidates. They've all been in the company for 20 or 30 years. They've been promoted a zillion times and they're all essentially the same. It doesn't matter whom they pick because they're all equivalent. Um, and so that's a case where it doesn't matter. And he was suggesting that in most cases, he studied American presidents and English prime ministers. And his conclusion was that in many cases, who won the election or who won the nomination and then subsequently the election in the United States and then the equivalent process in England, um, didn't matter because the party was choosing from among politicians that it knew very well and they would all be essentially the same. But then there were exceptions. And um, he, as, as he gave three examples, and I don't think we have time to go through the examples. Jefferson, Lincoln, and Wilson, three American presidents. Do you want to guess who, who was, who, which ones were um, uh, let us say, organization men, and which one were out? Which ones were outliers? 
Like, um, huh? would Lincoln be an outlier? You're right on that. Jefferson seems organization. Huh? Jefferson, Jefferson seems like a new organization. Very good. And Wilson? Outlier. Outlier. Right. Well, you guys are brilliant. You guys are absolutely brilliant. Yes. Um, Jefferson had been in politics enough so that the Democratic Party knew very well who he was and um, nominated. Now, it turns out the election was important because, if I'm not mistaken, he was running against Aaron Burr. And this was a guy who didn't want as president. Um, but I, I could be wrong. I'm not good at history. Um, but, Will, but Lincoln was very much an outlier. His total congressional experience was one year as a congressman before he was elected president. And um, are there post-election problems with this, though? Because you could just, like, if you look at it afterwards and say, well, that person was obviously just from, you know, uh, um, an outlier. Like, but that's because you have the information after he was president, and you saw that he was an outlier. Can you show it from beforehand? I know I didn't word that question very well, but... Well, I mean, in the case of Obama, I think it was pretty clear that Obama was an outlier. Well, of course, an outlier means simply that you came in, that, that you were an unexpected winner of the presidency or of being prime minister. So it was unexpected. You were not chosen. Your, your choice was not a result of the organization. It was chance and good luck. And in the case of Lincoln, what actually happened was there were two very strong candidates, Seward from New York and whoever was the governor of Ohio. On the other hand, the governor of Pennsylvania was corrupt. And so the, the Lincoln people went to the governor of Pennsylvania and said, if you throw your forces behind Lincoln, we'll make you Secretary of War. He said, yes. He was uh, a guy who, it was said, was um, so crooked he would steal anything but a hot stove. <laughs> and some people thought he would take the stove, too. Um, and uh, Lincoln, um, in his effort to get the nomination, well, what happened was the Democratic Party didn't want to have a convention in New York, because then it would be a sure thing for Seward or in Ohio, because it would be a sure thing for the governor there, or the senator, I don't remember. So they had it in Chicago, where there were no legitimate candidates. But of course, Lincoln was from Illinois. He had been a railroad lawyer, so he could get free tickets on the railroad. And he had all sorts of people sent in on free tickets, who had strong voices and would cheer Lincoln whenever his name was mentioned. Also, since the Chicago people, this sounds like a bomb, right? the Chicago people arranged the seating of the Democratic Convention. They put the Ohio people in one place and then surrounded them <laughs> by, I'm sorry, they put the New York people in one place, surrounded them by Ohio people. So there was no way they could collaborate because they were enemies. And the swing states, they sat way in the extremities of the convention hall so that the Ohio and the New York people couldn't get to them. This would be for cell phones and so forth. And they had the rafters packed with Lincoln people with very loud voices who would cheer Lincoln any time. What they were betting on, of course, was that the candidates from New York and Ohio were deadlocked in the first round, and then the people would cheer for Lincoln and he'd get the nomination, which is exactly what happened. All right, that's enough. Sorry that went on so long. So let's start now the electron positron scattering. Let me get a little bit of water so I'll take coffee. Okay, well, there are two processes. As usual, you remember, you expand this thing, you get the second order term, which is 1 over 2 factorial, but you cancel the 2 because you're integrating over x and y, and some, what happens at x can happen at y, so you just decide what happens at x. So here's one process. The electron comes in, 
at x it scatters and goes out. So P s, B prime, S prime. Then the positron comes in, and Feynman's way of drawing the positron is this way. And this is at y, and we're going to exchange a photon. And so this comes in with qt and goes out with q prime, t prime. Now, as we'll, we'll compute this, but we're also going to see that there's another diagram, which is the electron can come in, again be absorbed at x, but now the positron can also be absorbed at x. And now a photon goes over to y, and this makes the electron p prime, s prime, and the positron q prime, t prime. So these are the two diagrams. Time is going this way. Notice I've drawn the photon lines horizontal. That means that y could be earlier in time or later in time. All right, so let's look at this thing then. P prime, S prime, Q prime, T prime, U, P, S, Q, T equals. Okay, well, first of all, it's going to be E squared. And I'm writing it, I'm writing it, I'm using the psi bar notation rather than the IE psi dagger. So in the psi bar notation, well, that's interesting. What? Okay. All right, wait a second. I, I, I want to get these eyes right. This IE psi bar. dagger. Right. This, this, something's going on here. I E psi bar is minus E psi dagger. So if we're writing it this way, it's minus E. Okay. That gives us an E squared. Excuse you multiplying it by the minus I. Um, I E, but then there's an I gamma zero, I squared is minus one. But, but then so your x your u is t e to the minus i integral of v of t. Oh Christ, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You're at yeah, right. That's really good because in fact I I was always searching for that i when I was writing this up and I saw I think I missed that I. But um, you're right. So you have minus I times this times minus E, I, E. OK, so this then actually is a minus E squared. Do you want chocolate? Okay, so P prime, S prime, Q prime, T prime, an integral, time ordered product, and the second ordered term then is psi bar, and um, I'm going to use the positive frequency part at y, A slash at y, psi minus at y, psi bar minus at x, A slash at x, Annihilation part at x, and then uh, d fourth x, d fourth y, p s q t. Okay. Now, why did I put in these pluses? The plus means that we're annihilating the electron at x. The minus means we're creating the electron at at x. The plus here means that we're annihilating the positron at, no, we're creating the positron, we're annihilating, these should both be minus actually. 
oh no, I'm not doing this diagram, I'm doing this diagram. We're annihilating the positron at y, so it's the first diagram, so forget this. In fact, I think I should erase this. This was just to whet your appetite for the second part, which we'll do on Wednesday. So we're annihilating the positron at y, that's this. We're creating the positron at y, that's that. And so those are the terms. And so this then is minus e squared. And now we remember what, what happens here at x and x prime. It is that we have the, the field over here psi. When it annihilates the electron, we get a u divided by 2 pi to the 3 halves. And um, when it creates another electron, that's the U dagger, we're going to get a U bar. Um, actually, I think there wasn't a mistake, now that I think about it. But anyway, this is U bar and a 2 pi to the 3. Now, so let me just look at these. Again. We've got, the point is I'm not using this, I mean this is correct, but what I'm using is minus i v and v is i e psi bar, so it's actually, in other words, what I'm using is this. I'm going to be using this expression. So in other words, minus i times i is plus 1, and so there is a plus here. But if you write it in terms of psi dagger, then it's, a, um, it's, it's the other one. Okay, so what we get at this point then is q prime t prime integral time ordered product and now psi bar, annihilating part at y, a slash at y, psi creating part at y, and then what's left here is u bar p prime s prime, a slash of x, u of p and s. And now the phase factors that are associated with those uh, terms which are e to the i, p minus p prime x, t for the annihilating part, minus p prime for the creating part. Both are happening here at x. Okay, all of that, d fourth x, d fourth y, and what's left is qt. All right, let's just make sure we've got the signs right. What happened here was we had this state PSQT, and we agreed that that was B dagger of P and S, C dagger of QT on vacuum, and B of, um, let us say, P prime, S prime, well, or P double prime, S double prime hits this. So this still leaves you with that, and then the opposite thing happens on the other side. So there aren't any extra minus signs. So that's what we've got there. The next thing is to use the, uh, the field at y to annihilate a positron, create a positron. And so if we swing this over here, the um, thing that is going to annihilate the positron is going to give us actually a v bar because this is the annihilation operator for the positron, the V bar, and the thing that creates uh, the positron is going to give us a V. And so what we get now, and the... All right, and let me, let me just make sure that we've got... Notice that this, this, this creation operator, in order to essentially couple with the operator over here, it has to cross two fermion operators, so that's a plus sign. Um, and here, 
I've got an extra minus sign coming in here. And I don't know where it came from. Oh, it's the order. Right. This is the annihilation operator. In order for it to, to couple with the creation operator here, it has to cross this fermion. So that's a minus sign. So now we have minus E squared vacuum. And I left out something because my arm was down. This is 2 pi cubed. So you, you get the spinners and the 2 pi to the 3 halves two of them at x, and so now we have 2 pi to the 6. And now we have integral we have integral vacuum time ordered product and let me just call alright, let me, let me do this in two steps. a slash of x of y, a slash of x vacuum and then the other stuff is, oh, from here, we're going to have V bar of Q and T. Well, no, I, I've gone too fast. I should just copy what's in the notes and not try to do it. All right, time order product. V bar of Q and T. This is all in the online notes, so. V of Q prime T prime. So this is the creation part, this is the annihilation part, and they're switched with positrons. E to the i, q minus q prime, y, u bar of p prime, s prime, a slash of x, u of p and s, and then e to the i, p minus p prime, x, Final vacuum, d fourth x, d fourth y. Okay. Um, I think we can quit at this point. And I see I have a recurrent typo in these notes. All right, any questions? Any? We're, we're, we're over time, but is there a question there? So, how do you know which operator is annihilating or polytron or electron? Well, we've got the electron being annihilated at x, the positron annihilated at y, and then we've got the electron created at x and the positron created at y. So in, why don't you swing the camera around? So in the field then, we, we use the field at x to annihilate the electron and create the electron. And, and so we use psi of, we use this part from psi of x and this part from psi bar. In fact, if, if I rewrite this in terms of psi bar, I, I should have probably done that. Let's get rid of these L's. It looks like this. So, in psi bar, you use this to create the electron at x, you use this to annihilate the electron at x. And then at y, you use this to create the positron at y, and this to annihilate the positron at y. Okay.
Right, they, well that's where this minus sign came from. This annihilation operator had to cross this creation okay. operator to get out there. To oh. get to hit that. Okay. The alternative way is to say that this creation operator had to create, cross this annihilation operator in order to get that. By the way, one thing I've noticed in writing up these notes is if you're dealing with something that's latex, it actually makes it easier to think. And because um, I remember lecturing on this stuff years ago, I would be using a yellow pad and I'd have my yellow notes and they would be written in pencil. And it was just much harder for me to write the notes and to lecture. Um, and I, th I think it's that really these computers and LaTeX have just really made things easier to understand. Because when, you, when you're looking at something, all that visual scatter goes into the brain and all those neurons get used up trying to just separate the wheat from the chaff. All right, well, I don't want to keep doing that.